This is Fred Beck from Fred Talks Fighting. I'm joined by Alexis over Zoom. Alexis, I take I appreciate you taking the time out to talk to me today. I know you're a very, very busy man, but obviously the fight happened on the weekend. The fight you said would never happen. Mike Tyson and Jake Paul. I take it you tuned in. Mm. I did, and I, I wish it never happened. <laughs> if I'm honest with you, this, I mean, yeah, it, it is what it, it, you know, it was what it was. You know, I think it was just a, you know, great bit of marketing, a uh, great bit of, um, sort of mo a money grab for everybody. But realistically speaking, it didn't do any favors for boxing. It didn't do any favors for Mike Tyson. Definitely didn't do any favors for Jake Paul, but it did for Netflix. I think it did great numbers, and I think it's a great introduction to the, uh, to the kind of, you know, having large events on, on the uh, on Netflix, you know, from NFL to soccer to boxing, I think it's a great introduction for for Netflix to do that. I think it reached a lot of people. They did great numbers, but um, from a combative point of view, I mean, I thought it was ridiculous. But uh, Mike Tyson, we impressed. I guess the first round is his round. We fought very very well. And then after that, kind of slowly went downhill. Where you can see he didn't have the the rhythm, the movement anymore. Were you impressed with him in the first round? Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm not impressed at all. I mean, I'm impressed with with Mike Tyson being able to be 60 years old and to be in that kind of shape and to still, you know, to still turn up and show out like he did. But realistically speaking, it wasn't a boxing fight. It wasn't a boxing match. It was there were two minute rounds. You know, there were very little punches thrown by Mike. Jake, there was not much pressure. I didn't, you know, as, as nostalgic as, as it may have been. If we're talking about real real fighting, that, that wasn't real fighting. But you know, I'm happy uh, Mike is is okay and he didn't get hurt. And um, I hope he doesn't do anything like this again. Do you see the post I interview though, where he was like, "I might do it again." Never say never. He didn't like give a hard yes or a hard no. Yeah, I, I think I, I'm old enough to remember Mike's retirement speech of boxing, which was. I never want to discredit the sport of boxing. You know, I don't have it in me anymore. I'm not this type of guy anymore. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this to myself. I don't want to be disrespectful to the fans and to boxing. I remember his last actual fight, was it 15, 20 years ago when he said that. And that's kind of how I want to remember Mike. I don't really want to remember him as just going there for a money grab. You know, I hope he doesn't need it. You know, I hope he got paid well, but, I, you know, I hope he looks after himself and his family and doesn't need to do this kind of stuff anymore. It, I just don't think it, it, it did anything for anyone. I mean, I wasn't, there was nothing, it's really difficult, there's nothing to critique or, or say, other than there were two minute rounds and Jake looked like he got tired in two minutes. And they both looked, but obviously Jake looked inflated in weight, not his natural weight. He looked like he wasn't carrying it very well. Uh, I think he said he had injury as well, if I'm not mistaken, an sprained ankle or something. But yeah, it just, I don't know, it wasn't, it didn't do anything for me. Did you, were you impressed that Jake kind of held off towards the end, but he didn't try and put the KO on? Was that kind of agreed beforehand, do you reckon, or not have got Mike out of there. How do you think that Jake performed in there? I think realistically speaking, Jake knows his audience quite well. So I think he thought, you know what, if I can put him away, I probably shouldn't. I don't know whether he could or he couldn't. I mean, you know, obviously he held back uh, punch-wise, but I also think that what's he going to get out of it? Sometimes when you go to try and knock somebody out, that, that's when the other person's at their most dangerous. And the flip side of the coin is, I think Jake is... Um, I think he's playing the coin on both sides. I think he understands that if he knocked out Mike Tyson at 60 years old, it was like when Evander Holyfield fought Vita Belfort. No one liked Vita Belfort for knocking out Evander Holyfield when he was like the same age as Mike Tyson. Um, it was terrible. I was there live for it. I was like, oh, it's just ugly. It's an ugly look. No one wants to be part of that. You know? And considering Jake knew that Mike went to hospital and had, and had multiple you know, 25 litres of blood transfusions you know, uh, in, in summertime, uh, Jake knew all of this and still continued to go on with the fight. That kind of tells you where you're at and what type of person you're dealing with. They just want numbers and they just want things. But realistically speaking, it wasn't a competitive fight. So to say, I wasn't happy that Jake, I think Jake knew that he had to hold off on him. Otherwise, he'd have got more more heat than he's already getting now. Do you feel that Jake could have laid on a little bit more? Do you feel he could have jabbed a bit more, made it more exciting? Or he had the perfect performance in the situation he was in? I think they're two minute rounds. So by the time you throw a jab and have a clinch or the guy moves around, you spin on, you turn around, the, the rounds are already done, they're already over. I mean, if you look at the fight beforehand, you look at uh, Amanda Serrano and Katie Taylor, you look at those rounds, you look at the work rate and the punches thrown in those rounds, that's a real fight. That's a, There's a difference.
So I definitely think that this wasn't a, a real competitive fight. I definitely think there was a, no one tried to knock anyone out. You know, it was a 14 ounce gloves, two minute rounds and not many punches thrown kind of tell you the story of that fight. Mm, okay. I guess you see them as kind of polar opposites, Kay Taylor, Mana Serrano fight, and then the main event of Jake Paul, Mike Tyson, two opposite end of the spectrum. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you, you've got to remember someone like, um, also you're dealing with an orthodox and a southpaw as well with Kate Taylor and uh, and Amanda. And the, you know, the one's a pressure fighter, you know, one's a volume puncher. So, you know, and also it's a rematch as well. So there's, there's a lot going into it. Those, those girls have spent a lot of time with each other, training for each other and in the ring with each other. So the workload was always going to be higher. But saying that, you know, it was a, you know, it, you can't call a, 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 a male boxing match um, with two minute rounds, uh, uh, you can't call that a real fight. It's, it's never been a professional boxing fight. It has to be threes because three minutes really changes the game uh, from a from a tactical point of view, from a conditioning point of view, and from a punch selection point of view. That cha it changes the game. It really does. It, it makes you fight a certain way, or it makes you fight another way where you drown people. You take them into the deep end early, knowing that you might lose the first three or four, but come five, six, and seven, you're going to you're going to you know you're going to get on top of them. I think that those things taken out of the equation. For the um, for the Jake Paul fight, it only went to kind of heighten the fact that it wasn't really a real fight. If that makes sense. In you make of like kind of Mike's blood clots and his blood transfusion, and did you see the story the other day, or they came out yesterday, I believe they nearly part, they nearly died in June, I think. Yeah, I mean, if you follow Mike Tyson, like you look at his podcast, you follow, him, you know how old and fragile he's looking. He's done great to get in the shape that he's got into. It's outstanding. And I'm super happy for him. But to sell it as a competitive fight is, I mean, you see one boxer, go on IG and look at one boxer, uh, uh, you know, from the Javante Davises to the Garcias to the, you, you know, all the kind of influential boxers at the moment. And they're all saying the same thing. Like, you know, Michael was trash, the fight was trash. And it wasn't a fight and they're upselling something that shouldn't be upsold. But saying that, I'm not discrediting uh, Mike Tyson. The fact that he's 60 years old and went in there and did that and in that sort of shape is, is a credit and it's outstanding. It's, I'm a huge fan of that, but I'm not a huge fan of that being sold to me as a competitive fight. Mm. And watching that fight now, does that give you more confidence in KSI fighting him or less confidence? Where do you stand in that part of it? Yeah, exactly the same. Jacob got nothing different to what we all think he has. We're not taking away any of his attributes. He's got a solid team around him. Uh, he's a big boy. Uh, he has the same punch selection in all of his fights. He does pretty much the same stuff. He's well conditioned. It's just not enough to be uh, KSI. Stylistically, in my opinion, you know, we have the speed, which is power. Jake has the strength. But endurance-wise, we're very, very fit. You know, I mean, people say stars make fights, and I think that's what it does. So I think, realistically speaking, with, with KSI versus Jake Paul, KSI is much faster. He hits harder. His punch selection is better. And we believe he's got his number, but that's why we want the fight. They believe that they've got... In fact, I don't think they do believe it, that Jake's got his number. And they're dismissing the fight because they don't want it. So, which, which I find interesting as well. In the post press conference, I asked Jake and Akisa, I was like, where can you go from here? How do you get bigger than this? And I guess it wasn't really like a proper answer going or a certain name when you're saying, oh, we'll fight X next year, mm -hmm. this time, whatever. Um, do you think they're sort of holding off for that KSI fight? Do you reckon it's possible you could do 185? Would you go heavier or lighter than 185? Is that maximum you'd have KSI at? Yeah, I think 185 is 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 the right, is a fair fight on 175. And then we go 180, then we go 183, then we go 185. How much are we going to keep coming up? Considering they both fought, you know, we fought lighter than that and Jake's fought 185. Also, I think the question that people should be asking is, Jake's only competitive fight of a boxer around the same age and around the same weight, he lost. And that was a Tommy Fury. Not a 40-year-old, not a retired taxi driver, not an MMA fighter, an actual boxer, he lost quite conclusively. Whereas when we took on the same guy and we moved up in weight, it was a much more competitive fight. Arguably, I thought we won. And so did a lot of people. But let's say, you know, you're going with the scorecard. We boxed that fight way better than Jake. And there is, it's not that, you know, you can say one plus one equals two. I'm not looking at how I, we fought and how... Before. I'm saying there is common ground to say that that fight isn't as far away as people think it is. And there isn't a reason why Jake thinks he's so much better 
than KSI, other than maybe he's nervous of losing the bag. Maybe if he loses to, to KSI, that's it for boxing. If Jake Paul loses to KSI, he can't fight this cruiserweight, can't call Canelo out, can't call Mike Tyson out for the next rematch when he's 65. He can't do any of that stuff if he loses to KSI. Whereas KSI could do whatever he wants. No one expects him to win, right? So mm. I really think that the, I think the pressure is all on Jake. I think that this is where the issue is. Do you see the improvements from Jake Paul's fight against Nate Diaz, Jake Paul's fight against Mike Perry, and then Jake two pros, Jake Four? Do you see those improvements, the steps he's taking, or do you not see much improvement at all? Where do you stand in that? Yeah, I think that I think that all of the opponents that Jake Paul has selected, he knows quite well. So he sparred with Mike Perry. He's got former knowledge of Mike Perry. He knows how good Mike is. He knows that, trust me, in it's very, very different to boxing gloves. Jake has sparred him. He had a you know massive you know, 30 pounds on him on come on fight night. Mike never fought that heavy. Which is why a lot of time with KSI, when people are saying, Oh, we should fight, you know, heavy. Yeah, but so we put on some weight. How's that going to help our speed? Like, well, don't get me wrong. We'll go up and wait for the right fights because that's what we're trying to do. We're going up and wait because we want Tommy Fury. Uh, sorry, uh, we want um, uh, Jake Paul. But realistically speaking, coming down in weight benefits you more than going up in weight. Unless you're super, super technical. Well, again, you know something. So I think realistically speaking, when it comes to Jake Paul and his past opponents, he's either know, knows that they're, you know, he's going to be weight bullying them. He's got former knowledge of sparring them. So he kind of knows where he's at with them. Who do you think Nikisa dislikes more? Dana White, Eddie Hearn, or Mams Taylor? Uh, Dana White. And then who's underneath there? Because we saw the Eddie Hearn stuff. Obviously, Eddie Hearn's got the 100 million lawsuit of them. And then Katie Taylor came in and beat their fighter. Yeah. Do you reckon Mams is more popular nowadays than Nikisa after these two? He, yeah, I reckon. Uh, well, I don't, it's weird because I don't see... Um, Mams, is, Mams is willing to do business with them. Like, you know, at the end of the day... Anything else coming up for you, though, aside from the... Oh, let's watch this, actually. I watched the UFC yesterday. Did you see it? Did you stay up till about 6 a.m.? I did. I watched it in the morning. Okay. Well, you woke up and watched it, then? Yeah, I woke up and watched it. Oh, yes, yeah, a better way to do it. Did you see Charles yeah. Oliveira, Michael Chandler, the fifth round, the best round of the whole fight? Yeah, and the, and the potential 20 back-of-the-head shots that maybe the referee let go a little bit. <laughs> but wasn't that allowed? Wasn't, wasn't the changes made? Because of John Jones fighting in New York, when they had the different gloves with the nine to six elbow, the twelve to six elbow rule allowed. Yeah, the the, the twelve to six is a downward, straight downward from from like heaven to earth. That's the the rule which you're allowed to do. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about the line, a, like a mohawk line. If you were to go down the back of your head from the base of your neck all the way up, that's the back of the head. And those shots, some of those shots were going down the back of the neck. So I mean, it was a little bit uncalled for. I think some of them we should have maybe warned them to calm it down. But saying that though, you know. Oliveira is a savage. I mean, the height of the... For me, the, the height of that fight, John Jones is just absolutely ridiculous. Outstanding. Fantastic. Do you think Tom Arsenal beats John Jones? No, I don't. And I, and I actually agree with John Jones. I think he's earned his right to do whatever he wants. He's been undefeated his whole life. He's got one blemish on his career, which was a downward elbow, which he was mounted on, on Mount Hamill years ago, which isn't a, a loss. He was winning the fight anyway. And they DQ'd it because of the rule. Now the rule's changed. They should technically get rid of that because he's an undefeated uh, goat of, uh, of mixed martial arts, bar none. And if he wants to have a super fight with uh, Alex Pereira for the, you know, the BMF belt, I think that's a great fight. And I think um, it's a super fun fight and it'll get, it'll get John Jones motivated. The one thing you don't want to do with John Jones is let him be unmotivated because then you'll never see him again. He's liable to go off and do what he does. And not fight. So I think if you want him to, if you want him to be to be around, I think it's it's it's, it's high time to kind of give him what he wants. Mm. Yeah, and uh, you're not wrong at all. I don't know. Do you, do you think you would hear Tom Aspinall rematch? Oh, uh, Tom Aspinall fight, or do you want to do the Pereira one? He says he's fight think, again. Yeah, I, I think I think John Jones will take it. Will will hustle. Will say no, 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 no. So you throw enough money in his face, and he'll say yeah, and then he'll just take John. They'll take Tom Aspinall out. That, that's the kind of guy John Jones is. He's just that kind of guy. It's not that I don't rate Tom Aspinall, I absolutely do. But you can't base, just because he's beaten four or five guys, you cannot base those wins against someone like John Jones. Whatever Aspinall does, Jones does better. Aspinall wrestles, Jones does it better. Strikes, Jones does it better. 
it, it, he kicks, he does it better. Either way, you know, no matter what happens, and you know, and at two different weights as well, from light heavy to heavy as well. Mm. So when Dana White's ranting on saying John Jones is the greatest of all time, you do agree with him? Hundred percent. And I think that um, it's difficult for, for for Dana to to not have control over it and not give anyone else any props. But if he decided just to let John Jones go and have a super fight with Ngannou, you would see John Jones absolutely destroy Frank Ngannou. Mm. You know, I, there's just, there's just no possible way. But John's wrestling is way too good. They just he didn't, put it together he didn't, so he didn't, he didn't even use it too much yesterday. He used a lot of striking. Yeah, he did. He hit one nice Sotogari, an outside leg trip. Beautiful. Like he just he just kind of played it, but he did what he wanted to do. He was just, you know, and then finishing it with a spinning back kick for the body off the offside. Instead of going under the right elbow for the liver, he went on the on the body side, the other side, which generally isn't a knockout. But how hard he hit that just completely blew the wind out of him. It must have shifted his organs slightly. And that impact was just straight down and out. Do the, do the organs move back afterwards or are they displayed? Yeah, they do. But you, that's the idea of hitting something in an upward fashion. You, you, you push the organs back in your body and you can reset diaphragms, which is why you kind of hold your breath in and hit, hit the deck. That's what body shots do that when they hit livers and diaphragms. So he's just got an amazing amount of timing and power. And that was precision. It's not like he threw 10 of those and missed them and landed one. He was very deliberate with what he did. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, the first backwards kick he threw and landed perfectly, right on the heel as well, yeah. Looked yeah, pretty but... nasty on the replay. But how impressive was uh, Michael Chandler's con strength and conditioning? Managed to have Oliver on your back twice and drop like that in the fifth round of a war. It's if pretty you look impressive. At Michael, yeah, if you look at Michael Chandler's career in Bellator as well, I know Michael uh, quite well. We fought on the same card a lot, a lot, with loads of different guys. I've had one of my guys uh, fight him as well. He's just an, always been a specimen always been active he's never really been in a in a dull fight in his life you know not sometimes not the smartest way of fighting if i'm honest with you or the most strategic way uh but always an exciting fight always in shape always super um yeah he's a powerful physical athlete you know mm, no certainly certainly indeed um for a go anything else coming up for you in the next few weeks are you going to come to qatar we'll always see you there yeah actually we are in qatar um we've we've uh we start and work, so we're in Qatar. <laughs> yeah, so we're in Qatar every day um, with you guys uh, for the show and obviously uh, training some fighters. We've got some guys fight fighting on the same weekend um, in Saudi, actually in Riyadh season in PFL, um, so not too far away on the same on uh, the day after um, Misfits, and then I've got another couple of fights. Uh, I think another six fights by the end of the year, and then we signed a quite a big one. Uh, for the UFC next year that should be coming out in the next week or two. Well, you, you signed so, a guy, one of your guys, to go into the UFC. Yeah, no, one of my guys in the UFC, um, MVP, and we signed him a very big fight uh, in the UFC coming out in February. So they should they should, uh, they should should let that contract out so everyone knows and publicise it next week. And then um, we have another couple of big boxing fights um, in February and then move on to another big fight in Misfits in March. Awesome. Well, Alexis, as always, I do appreciate you taking the time out. I know it's a little bit later in the day. I'm in Nashville right now, so I'm about nine o'clock, so not too, uh, not too late for me. But yeah, thanks very much, man. I do appreciate it as always. Pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.